OK, so first part, introduction types. Um, when we talk about types, the first question that comes to our mind is, what is a type? So do any of you have any sort of intuition? What is a type? Anybody? Yes? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Types kind of think the domain of a function, a set of acceptable values. Or you could say it's like a way to categorize the values. Well, yes, basically types were made up as a way to like having a set of values and having some expectations about it. For our purposes, we can just think that type is, well, just a set of values. They're not strictly speaking the same things because there are two different theor theories, set theory and type theor theories, but for our intuitions, those are basically the same. We have like, for instance, integers is just like a set of one, two, three, four, are all of those numbers, strings are empty string, one le character long string, some lower lorem ipsum, and so on. So those are all values of the type string or of type int. This is something that most of us understand intuitively. Yeah, it's just a collection of values. So just, an, just an example how we use it in Scala is like when we declare some value, we use this double dot sign to write the type after the value, then after the equal sign, we will write the actual value. So that's how we define, define our values. Um, this is called type annotation, because this way we, will, we are saying that we have some value e, just in this example, um, its type is integer and its value is zero. Then we have some value s. So, so value s, its exact value named s, its value is a, and its type is string. Um, from the type theory, this, this is exactly notation taken from the type theory. This notation is called judgment. So we could say that the um, judgment of e is integer. A similar thing is about functions. We have function double, it takes argument x, which is judged as integer, so its type is integer, and it, it, all, it, all of that returns also value of type integer. Very similar thing to that is type ascription, which we see below. It is to use the, to indicate that we want, we expect this value to be of this type, and if compiler cannot prove that this value have this type, then compilation will fail. It's mostly used in Scala projects to upcast or just make sure or force compiler to check something for us. Okay, so if we know types, uh, that types are something like sets, then if we are familiar with the set theory, we also know that there is something like subset, and it directly translates to subtyping. So for instance, we could have a type user, which could contains all sort of values, which are represents our users. We could split it into two smaller sets, like members and admins, if we want to treat members and admins as separate things. Um, and it directly tra translates to subtyping. So member is a subtype user, admin is a subtype user. If we wanted to write it down in Scala, it would look like, like this. So, hmm. okay. so mathematically we could say that, what, what is subtyping? Subtyping is some sort of um, mathematical property that um, if we say that each, that member is a subtype of user, then every value belonging to the type of member is automatically a value of type of user. Um, so that's how we could define it mathematically. So about these interruptions. Um, so yeah, 
if you wonder what is this small sign between member and user, it means is a subtype of. Um, we use it like that because we think that user is a bigger type than member because it's like you know contains all of its values, and so if we made like a hierarchy or something like that, that it will be above it. Or if we we can also think of it as a partial order if you knew it from the mathematics. So because set of users is bigger bigger than set of members, we can well basically use the lesser than signs between them. In this case, we added this double dot after the smaller than sign, so that Scala wouldn't confuse it with the comparison operator, and that's just the only difference. <clears throat> this is another example. Here we don't have two different things. We have simply that admins are uh, sub subtypes of user. There is no other type, so we can see that there are values that are belonging directly to the set of users, also values that belongs to both user and admins, so that admins is a subtype of user. We could represent it like that, so it should be pretty intuitive for everyone how it works. Okay, so once we understand how subtext works, we can move to something else, which is list upper bound and type inference. Small example. We have some value e, which is integer, and depending on its value, we create some other value x. It might be some i, it might be none. So, what is the overall type of x in such example? Well, let's think, think about some type here for, for a while. Um, when we have M3, it's very visible, so I maybe explain it. Okay, so here we have type sum of some integer, which is a subtype of option of integers. Here we have none, here we have scala null. Also some like things like serializable, Java serializable, equals product, and so on. I want to talk about it because we need to understand that there is a built-in hierarchy of types in Scala. So at the top of it, it there's always n. Whatever value you have in Scala, it will be of type of any. But of course, we hardly ever need something as generic as that. Then, depending if it's um, represented by an object or a primitive in JVM, uh, underneath you have an ref. Here, uh, as an example of some, it will be an ref and for, for instance, ints, or doubles, or cars, or balloons, we will have an eval. Then there has some intermediate classes just for scalar options, so actually, just for this example. And underneath, on the very bottom of the hierarchy, all of possible values in Scala will be, will have type nothing. Sorry, otherwise. Type nothing contains all of possible types in Scala. Sorry, no types in Scala. It is like a subtype of all of possible types in Scala, so it contains no values. We can always specialize any type in Scala more and more and more as, as, long, as much as we reach nothing, and then it contains no possible values. Right above nothing, there is Scala null, which contains only one value, null. It's used to, um, it can be only, only types that are references in JVM can be specialized to this type null. So it can be it's very often used in Scala library to prove that some type is not a primitive and can be casted to reference underneath. I'm talking about in this example because we will try to figure out um, 
in this example above. What might be the possible types of both of those branches? So let's first follow the sum i branch, sum integer. Oops. Okay. So if we have a value of type sum integer, of course it has the type of sum integer, but it is because sum integer is also an option of integers, so this, this value will be also this type, those two types above, this one, and of course scala any. If we move to this other branch, which is scala known, it will also have this type, this type, this type, this type, this type. Anyway, what, what we can do with those two possible branches is find out the common part. So here we have with bold fonts the possible types for some, some integers. Those will be the, all of these um, types, while Scala known are all of these types. So this is the common parts for all of the, for these two possible val values. One of them which is some integer and other which is none. Uh, we can see that it is a Scala option, product, serial, able, equals, and array of any. So what is interesting to us is that it creates some sort of a, a hierarchy. And if we wanted to figure out the most specific type if among all of those possible, then we will find out that this is the Scala option, the one directly above those two possibilities. Um, this is called least upper bound. If we think, think about our types as a partial order, and <coughs> ordered sets or partial ordered sets of values, then when you have two values, we might try to have to find an upper bound for them. So some value that is bigger than both of them. For some integer and num, those are all of the tapes I um, enumerated, option, product, and so on. But the option is the most specific about all of them. So from the point of view of um, partial orders, this is the least upper bound of um, our type T. And basically this is how type inference work in Scala. When we have any sort of value, we look what are the possible types or constraints put on this particular value, and then amongst all the constraints, uh, we'll, try, we'll try and find the least upper bound. So least upper bound is virtually the way type inference works. So here you can see, but in this, in this example, when we have this x, its type would be inferred to option of integers because this is the most specific type the scala can infer because this is the least upper bound of those two different types that this value can have. Okay, next part is our ADTs. Mm, this is a very important concept. Basically the idea is that when you have sets and we are doing some operation on mathematics, we usually want to be able to add them on the, or have some sort of a intersection of type of sets or having some concentration products. So ADTs are basically um, um, translation of these ideas into the types. We usually understand ADT as a either a product of or a product type. So what are product and coproduct types? First, we have a tuples. We need to have some basics to, to explain those two definitions. First, we have a tuple. A tuple is an ordered pair or collection of two elements when we can say which one of, the, which of them is the first one and which is the second one. 
In set theory, ju we just define it like that. Set, it comes, it contains two sets. One of them is the first value. One of them is both values. And this way we can figure out, figure out which one is the first and which one is the second. So when we, once we have a tuple defined, we can define Cartesian product. So Cartesian product of two sets are all possible tuples of where the first element is from one set and the other is from the second set. So also pretty easy definition. Then once we have a Cartesian product of two, we can generalize it to n tuple. Basically, we we can assume such equality that we have a tuple on the second place it's as if it was a triple, quadruple, and tuple, and so on. Um, in programming languages, it is more common to make it right associative because of Lisp and cons and so on. In mathematics, it's more common to make it left associative. But we are using Scala, so we will move on with this right associative stuff. Yeah, so here's another example how we can um, generalize the conversion products. Same way with n tuples, we can generalize Cartesian products of n sets. So it's still the same idea. And here it is, here's our interesting thing, because when we have this product type, like, like a tuple, here represented by type x, we can think of it as something that have string on first place, int on second place, double on third place. Um, but the same thing can be said about case classes or normal classes exposing vowels. So, from the point of view of um, just raw data, not the behavior and anything like that, those four constructs are virtually the same. If we only looked at the types and not at the names of the variables, properties, and so on. Um, so all of them we can consider product types from the point of view of our compiler because it's just a set of datas ordered in some, basically on, yeah, ordered in some, this, in some way. Um, this is um, used by Shapeless Library, if any of you heard about it, to using some sort of like generic representation. Basically the idea is that you could like build this type from, from the back to front, by prepending the uh, next and next element of this um, type, and then have some, some way to translate any of those types into this intermediate type, and then from this type to the other type. So that is the one um, advantage of this technique. The other one is that you can, the same way we compose those types, you can also compose the code that will handle them, but this is kind of um, advanced topic, so we'll leave the data list for some other tech. The other uh, ones we have product defined, we might think about product is basically like multiplication of types. So when we have multiplication, we might also want to have addition. And one of such additions is disjoint union. Disjoint union basically means we have some type x, which is um, something that is either of type y or of type z, not all, both of them at once. This is an exclusive alternative right here. So do we have such example? Well. We could define one. In Scala, we can basically achieve that using silt, silt traits and case classes. That's one example of achieving that. If we have 
any value of type credentials will be either login password or access token. And we'll have guarantee that is one of those two types, but no both of them at once. Um, so we can use pattern matching or something, uh, for instance, to distinguish them. But usually, this is um, the limitation of Scala at this moment that we can only use the traits and silk traits or silk classes and then implement them using inheritance to build the um, union types. Because in general, some other languages also allow us to backtake to existing tags a set. Okay, at this point we will have either this one or this one without any sort of combinations like that. Well, another uh, way of working, working this around is using something like either, which is basically saying that we will have either this type on the left or the type on the right, but it, the, those types are wrapped in, in, into the object, so there's always some sort of overhead. Um, so in Dot there will be something like called union types, which will be kind of like Mm, well, basically, there's, there's a difference between disjoint union and normal union in this sign over here. This one means this is exclusive alternative, so it cannot be both of those types at once. And in Dotty, we will they will be introduced introduce something like um, union types, which means that we could have like sum of both times if both of them happen to be the same time, it will be no problem because um, this definition allow allow us to, to be to, to, so that this would be oh, sorry. So that this would be of both of the type types at once. Here it is not possible, but in general it is possible to define a type that those two of types, two of those types at once. Um, other way of having sort of union, oh sorry, intersection. The compact types are ways of having set intersection in types. Basically, we can have, for instance, we have a uh, right string, type count, and we can also have something that combines those, those two types. We define using word with. And the interesting thing is that when it comes to passing those values, build like that, then the order in which this, these uh, types appear is irrelevant. As long as we only pass them, then we can pass them, we can switch those types around it's all the same. It's basically derived from this mathematical property that alter that um, that this operation, the conjunction is um, you, you can switch those sides and it will be still the same um, result. So if you use it in Scala, you have that string with count or count with string. Then no matter which or in which order you declare them, it, you can use them uh, interchangeably. But only when it comes to declaration. In this example, we see, we, we see that we will have some sort of trait A, which defines a value. Then we have that trait B, which extends A, but doubles this value, the value that its parent has. Some other trait which would increase the value its parent has. Then if we combine those two types, B and C, and the types C and B, well, basically Scala will let us use those two interchangeably. However, Will the results also be interchangeable? Will the results also be the same? Well, not necessary, because with compound types, there is something called trite linear, linear organization. It was, used, it was introduced to Scala to avoid the diamond problem. Basically, we, when you have examples like that, 
we can run into the issue that when we refer to value, which value is it? Is it value from the one implementation, from B or C or, or A, whatever. So what Scala does, it simply sell, says in which order you add those types, combine them with width. In this order, you will override this value so that the last one will be the one that you will uh, access. So in this example, you can see that when we have this sort of compound type, then we will have something like that extends A, then extends B, then extends C. Of course, it doesn't happen in a way that we will normally see. It happens during compilation and potentially generates a lot of intermediate classes that we normally wouldn't see unless we have some sort of stack overflow around an exception. And if we calculate the, the value of um, this example, we would see that depending on in which order we in which order we compose those types, then the result value would differ. Um, okay, this one didn't work out, but basically the Dotty wants to replace, or at least makes an alternative to compound types, which they call intersection types. And the idea is that you would ha will have a way of combining two types in a way that will never run this, this problem that depending in which order you um, combine the, val the values, the behavior will, will change because that is really hard to debug and really hard to reason. Um, and you, could, you will be able to declare those intersection types like using the ampersand. Okay, when, when it comes to classes, because that is another um, thing worth mentioning, when we look at them the mathematically, class is something similar to set, but when we group values based on some predicate called indicator function. So we can think that this word was probably the inspiration of what class became in object-oriented pr programming. Because usually when we declare some object, we have some expectations that it will have this and this and that method, this and this and that property. So if we create this object, it will, have, it will take this and this memory when it comes to C++ language. Mm, of course, this is very constrained um, usage of um, those predicates. So there is a difference between what we understand as a class in programming and what mathematicians think of when they say class. Mm, but it's worth knowing that we can also use this mathematically defined class um, in functional programming. Um, which we will show it a little bit later, basically on the second part of the presentation. Um, another type that is worth um, mentioning is unit. Um, probably everyone who wrote any sort of program in Scala saw this unit type. So, question, why is it called unit? Sorry? Well, yes, yes, it's very close to the idea, but um, why would we call it instead, instead, I don't know, singleton or void? Because in many languages, something like that, the way we use unit in many languages is used, is called a void type. So why is it unit? <clears throat> okay, the idea is that in category theory, when they were um, trying to find some sort of like consistent way of describing functions, they decided that each function should always take one value as an input and one value as an output. 
if you want to have multi argument fu function with already bigger than one, then you should return function, which returns function, and so on. But this model had that small issue one if you have function with nullarity, null, null so function that doesn't take any arguments, and function, or something like procedure, so function that doesn't return any result. You still need to model those things, but with this assumption that you always take one argument and return one value, it would be quite difficult. So the way they solve it is they introduce um, two additional types, extra types, one of them they call the initial object or void, and they always use it to represent the function that well, it acts like an argument for a function that normally wouldn't ever receive any arguments. And the other is called the final object or unit, and they use it to represent the value returned by all the functions that shouldn't return value. So this workaround was adapted by Scala. In Scala there is no void type because Scala has a native separate for nullary functions. But to have the type consistent and let you not have such issues like C++ when you might have void function or function returning void and then you have made, a, made an exception how the templates work and so on. In Scala we have unit tab which has only one um, instance, this one, to be able to have a behavior that is consistent that you can basically um, use it as a type parameter or pass on, put in the map and anything like that because there is no exception that there's some non-existing type or anything like that. Um, the interesting thing is that when you look at how unit looks, you might think that null is an example that unit is an example of like tuple of zero, which would be very reasonable, I believe. But unfortunately in Scala not no null unit is not any, anything of that, anything like tuple. I think in dotted they fixed this, but not in Scala too. Okay, type constructors are okay. So mm, to explain what are type constructors, we need to make a distinction that there is something called concrete concrete type. When we have string or integer or I don't know map of doubles from doubles to I know other double. This is a specific set of values, and we can create an instance for this, this very type because we know it. We know basically anything that there is to know about this type and so on, which, which, which is why we call it a concrete type. Um, but in set theory, where everything is a set and the function is also a set, Okay, we have a list without any arguments. Do we, can we call that a type? Well, we can, even though it's hard to tell anything about the values of list when we don't have an argument passed. So, let's do a little bit of a reminder of a set theory. In set theory, any type, First, an integer, double, string, and so on is a set of values. Um, Function is also a set of values. More specifically, it's a set of pairs with an extra um, condition that the first value cannot be repeated so that we can figure out the very exact pair basing order on its first um, element, which we can call argument and then the second element you can call value of a function because that's what a function in functional in set theory is. It's basically a collection of, of such tuples. So if we can make a part of uh, 
sets as well, then we should be able to create a function which takes one set and returns other set as a value. Um, except not on a value level, but on type level, because in many program languages those sets and is in STD set or Scala sets are something different than type, even though mathematically they're um, just a different instance of the very same thing. So when we have a list, list is basically a function that takes some type, for instance, integer with all of its values and create a type list of integers with all possible values, so like empty list, list of one, list of quite a lot of numbers, same with string. List takes this all possible values of string and create set of all possible values of list of, of all those possible strings. So from, from mathematical perspective, um, we can define a function on, that works on types. Um, and usually when you have a such function, then in Scala syntax, we will uh, distinguish with this underscore to represent that at this point we think of this type, not as a concrete type, but as a function that will take some other type uh, before they both create some new type that we might use, but or which might need another type and so on. So, some example. Oh, another thing. So, that's how we can declare that this is a type, type constructor that takes an argument. And also, we would use this bracket with um, a letter when we indicate that this is an argument of function or if we're applying the argument function. So, the syntax is very um, context dependent. So here we, the A in the brackets, declare a parameter of this type. Here we call it A. So when we create a, the instance of this wrapper, then we expect that the value will be of type of A, but at this point, we are not yet knowing um, what is this type because we are abstracting away from it. And here we can see that um, we are applying integer to this wrapper, and this way, um, type constructor uh, takes int as an argument and returns wrapper of ints as a concrete type. You can also see that it works um, with type inference, so we not always need to specify all those types if the context provides enough information for the compiler to figure things out. Um, some such examples of are like option or list, either. Either is an example of um, parametric type that takes two types instead of one. Um, so that is the um, very basics that we need to know about types in Scala. So let's do a small summary, then we can make a break and move on to something more advanced. So <clears throat> a type is basically a set of values. That's the most intuitive way to think about it. Just as with the <clears throat> sorry, just like with the normal normal sets in a set theory we can create a subset or subtype, we can create a product set or product type, sum set and intersection, which would be translate to compound intersection types and sum types. Class is also a type. And unit exists only to avoid some special cases when function doesn't return any value. Right now we'll just return unit and have a um, consistent system of thinking about, about functions. So the second part is all you need to know about types in Scala except as I said in the beginning, we will skip several topics because they're not as interesting. 
<clears throat> so, first question is, what is a kind? Uh, actually, I'll answer this question. It's a type of a type, but I wonder if anyone understands it. So, let's try to run it in a console to show it what what a type is, what, what a kind is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. Sure it does. Da, da, da. Da, da, da. So So the scalar REPL gives us this ability to investigate a kind of a type. Um, and what does it tell us about kinds of string, list, and ether? So, about string, it, it tells us that string is a, its kind is A, that list kind is F, A, F for, of plus a and either is f of plus I, a1 plus a2. <clears throat> so if we think about types as a sets and functions and so on, we can think of that this means that this is a value in the type level. This is a function taking one parameter. We will explain what this plus means later on. And either is function taking two parameters. Also, this plus will be explained later, later on. Um, we could also, yeah. Uh, we could also ask, ask about this the kind of this tried neat tc and let's see what it will show us okay here it shows us that the kind of x tc is some x of f of a we can, we can try to guess that it means that this function the x takes some other function as an argument, which is why I had to import this higher kind compiler flag, because without that compiler compilation would fail as it is supposedly advanced feature of the language. Um, we can also try to give this question with more verbose answer. Sorry. Oops. Wrong order of parameters. <clears throat> yeah, so here Scala tells us that strings kind of is A. That star means that this type is a concrete type, and this type directly contains some values, or maybe not, because some types are empty and have no values, but basically this type operates directly on value level. Then we ask the same about list. Scala tells us that this is a type constructor and a first ordered kind of type, which basically means that if we think about types as uh, values and functions. This is a first order function which takes um, one argument, which is a type, and returns one value, which is another type. So 
in this case list takes for instance integer and returns the list of integers either would also be a first order kind of type only that this time with two arguments um, I believe those are ripped off from Husk, how Haskell ex um, explained those types with the exception of those pluses and minuses because that is a Scala thing that we will get to later on. Basically we can read it as look, this is a type, this takes type and returns type, this takes type, then takes another type, then returns type because this is a um, function taking two parameters. And when it comes to the TC trap that we declared like this, so type taking this type constructor as an argument, the what Scala would tell us about about it. Sorry. Scala will tell us that this is a more interesting fu function working on type level. This is a function that takes a function taking type returning type and this function returns so other type. It also goes more verbose that this is a type constructor that takes type constructor. So this is a higher kind of type. So this is way Scala told us what are higher kind of types that maybe some of you heard about? They are basically uh, type constructors, which are type level functions taking other type constructors or maybe returning other type constructors. So type um, uh, correspondent um, thing for higher, 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 higher level functions. Um, so, okay, now that we know what are type, what are kinds of higher kind of types, we can move on to more, more interesting topics like, okay, like, like type constraints. <clears throat> Let's say we have a situation like this. We have some type, you used to describe users. Users might be members of admins. And then we need to create some map that maps user ID directly into the user instance. So we have a set of users and we want to have a map of users, uh, IDs and users, then it is quite simple. There is no need to do anything fancy here. We can map this, map each user to a tuple from ID to the user and trans translate it to map. That is a very simple Scala code. Um, but when we try to um, make things more generic, because maybe we have set of admins or set of members, and we also want to receive map of admins or map of members, then we can no longer use this uh, very simple approach. Um, we need to make things more generic. So the simplest thing we could do would be to um, extract this id extracting function as a, another argument, make it all um, parametric, and this way we would be able to create map of some specific impl implementation of user um, the same way we created a map of all users before. But this, this is very bothersome, a lot of boilerplate. Basically we all know that this get ID is defined directly to the user, so what's the point of it? Um, that would be a bother in many languages that don't have which type system because we know that this U will always be some user. One just to tell that it will be some more specific user. So how we could do this? 
<clears throat> well, we can use the knowledge that the user will be an upper bound of all the values inside the set. The upper bound is something that we meant when we talk about least upper bound and type inference. So we can say that the U will be bounded from the top by user. So all of the possible um, um, types that we pass here need to conform to this condition. So whatever you this will be here, it will be some sort of user. It might be something more concrete, but it has to be user. So with this knowledge, Scala again has can use make use of the knowledge that user have as ID, and things work again. So we are able to just write, write, like that write uh, create map by ID for set of members, and we will receive map from into members set of admins, create maps into admins. So this upper bound let us um, make use of that knowledge we have to avoid the boilerplate. And sometimes it also let us make things possible or easier um, to achieve without um, injecting some extra logics or functions that would do things that we know that could be um, encoded direct, but direct, directly encoded because no, we know the requirements of the types. And just as we have upper bound, we also have lower bound. So for instance, if we use either to represent um, computations that might fail, and by the conventions we will represent the left side as an error and the right side as the um, results that we want to achieve, we would want to be able to recover from the failure. But when we are recovering, we might think that perhaps when we are recovering, the um, recovered value might be more generic than the value that would be there if it was um, the right value. So with the lower bound right here, we can make it so that this type B will be at most as specific as A, but not any more generic. So it's the direct opposition of the upper bound. If we express this using those hierarchy when the most generic type is at the top, the most specific type at the bottom, and this is saying that, okay, we have this type, you can use as a type parameter anything from this above. And here we can use it to, as an example, when we have a fiber of string of ad, string or admin. And we might say, okay, here we have um, a member in our recovery, and this way Scala will use um, the knowledge about type to make sure that the type it will infer, well, it can use inference here, but the type it will, um, it we will end up with will be either a string of users. So Scala is forced to generalize this type and generalize and came up with the type here that would be um, more generic than those two, but it, it can be more specific than admin, so an example how things work, work here. The only problem with this example is that uh, if we didn't pass on all of those um, types explicitly, Scala would infer this to be nothing and the compilation would fail, which is what I have, why I have to pass all those values explicitly. You don't have these problems when you use either try and other functions in the Scala library because it's not happening in one place, it's, it's, it's split into two parts because this is contained with the, with the type of the object and this is using the type of a function so Scala can figure out those two things at different times, which is why it can figure out that more specifically. Um, <clears throat> once we have types constraints, we also can have 
generalized time type constraints. So let's say we have some type A and B, and we want to make sure that one is a subclass of the other. Scala let us do this using this construction. The problem is that you cannot do this just like you would do this with, um, with the lower bound or with the upper bound directly, directly inside these brackets because this is not a construct inside the language. It's a construct implemented using classes and uh, values and implicits. So basically the idea is that if those two classes if one is the subtype of the other, there is an implicit in the scope that you could pass on here. So here it uses the implicit resolution also to let you put some constraints on those two types. And if the implicit is not in the scope, this comp the compilation would fail. So we effectively are able to put some constraint on, the, on, the, on those two types um, in relation to one another. Um, the other generalized constraint that Scala Predef actually provides you is this one. This implicit exists in scope every time that those two types, A and B, are equal. So if you have some very complex ways of passing types from one place and other parameters from from the other place, uh, you can use this to make Scala prove that those types would match and otherwise, if the types are not aligned, the, comp the compiler would fail. So for instance, this um, up update would work if you um, pass to the very same types, and if you, you pass to different types, even though one is the uh, sub subset or supper type of another, the compilation would fail because that's what this explicit evidence do, do, do for us. There are also two other generalized type constraints that are not available in the normal Scala. One of them is already removed, so I'm mentioning about it because if you're using some very old Scala like Scala 8 or 9, but I think it finished with Scala 8, then there was also a some more relaxed version of this subtype thing, which also allowed to pass things if the type A was subtype or, subtype or could be implicitly convertible to type B. And the other type generalized type constraint that you could use is uh, if the types are different. This one is provided by C++ because it's used inside the internal library. So this way, if you have some very, very complex rules about the parametric types and want to make sure that the compiler won't accidentally put two parameters together that are equal while they shouldn't, then you would be able to use this implicit evidence to make sure that the compiler would fail in this case if those types are the same. The other thing that we that is related to the type constraints is the type class syntax. What is the type class is kind of out of the scope of this um, talk, but the important thing is that if we have some parametric class or parametric trait or insert of parameter or type alias, then as long as it has only one parameter, that is a very important condition. When we have something like this, argument type parameter, uh, double dots x, Scala will try to find an implicit of the type of x with this type right here, fast as the parameter. So because of that, you are able to use um, this notation to put some sort, some sort of um, constraint of the type, meaning there is an implicit evidence of this parametric class for this particular type. So 
so instance, instance of such um, usage would be, um, let's say, CRC. If any of you use CRC encoders and decoders to generate um, encoders and decoders for JSON objects for case classes and so on. So if you have some parametric method taking, if you have some parametric method, then you could write something like uh, do stuff a double dot encoder. And this way you would ensure that you can call this function only if there is an implicit instance of the encoder for this type, and then you could use this, use this encoder insta inside this function. Okay, so still in the topic of parametric types, var variance. So variance is a one word, word describing three possible things. Um, so we will show some examples of where different kind of variances would be needed and then explain then well just name them. So first example of where we would need to know about the variance is something like this. First example is in well, both of these examples are in Java, not in Scala. Um, because this problem exists on JVM, so I wanted to demonstrate what happens when we don't have certain agreement about how things should, should work. So he, in the first example, we have, uh, have an array of strings. We put one string into this array, we put another thing into, string into this array, but this array can store three elements. Also, this array can be casted to array of objects without any sort of as in, as instance of or anything like that. Java allows us to do this. So we could pass this array of strings to some function which would cast it up into array of objects or anything like that. And then inside, when we have this array of objects that we think we can do anything about, because why not, it's array, it's array of objects, we should be able to put anything here. Then we get array store exception, because this is not array of objects, it's an array of strings, and you are not allowed to put integers here. So you would be surprised why this happened. Meanwhile, if you do the same thing with lists, like lists of strings, and if you try to use list of strings as a list of objects, the compiler would fail. So what would be the expected behavior if you have such a situation and what do I, which of them you would expect to be the correct one or incorrect one? Um, any ideas? Well, no, no, a casting integer to object doesn't work. The idea is that even if you would upcast integer to object, actually it is upcasted here. The upcast uh, I use here is only to make this integer um, boxed into in integer instance, which could be upcasted to objects. Only, only because of that, this compiles. But even though this compiles, in runtime you get an exception. So that is the problem that you get the error, but way too, uh, too late when the program is already running and, and you don't know what, what it, why it, it even happened. So actually the, the thing is that this one, the, um, this was before th this one because arrays are way older than generics. So with generics, the Java um, specification creators already have some insight of how things should not work, which is why they prevented this behavior from compiling, but it was already too late to fix this because of you know, backward comp compatibility. And general uh, consensus about such situation is that when you have mutable collections or any sort of mutable uh, parametric types that you might change their 
content inside, you should prevent the ability to change the type um, recklessly because it will always end up with errors like this because at any point someone would like to insert something that shouldn't be there or maybe you can pass it up or down to some other context so yeah and such situation when we say that okay we know that a is a subtype of b but um, you cannot expect to say that f of a is a subtype of f of b or the other way so in the case above it means that you have um, strings and objects we know that string is a subtype of object but we cannot we cannot assume that array of strings should be array of objects or the other way around so such situation in in uh, type theory is called invariance and that is the default in many languages because you know they figured out that it's not a good idea when you all of such things to happen um, in some languages like C and C++ even if you cast things directly then you know memory layout of objects is different so it's even more dangerous which is why they don't always so recklessly but Sometimes you want to get out of these defaults and when it comes to Java, you normally don't have the ability to do so. And how things look in Scala? Let's say we have some immutable containers, for instance, op op option. When you have option, you cannot just edit objects inside an option. You can create modified copy. When you have modified copy, you don't have a risk that, okay, here I am storing an option of let's say strings, you pass it to some function and this function makes modifications that your option of strings suddenly underneath will have integer and things will break. So there's no such risk because those objects are only, those objects are immutable. They can only return mutated copy, but they don't do allow you to change anything inside. So it's very safe to upcast and downcast. So let's say we have set definition of option with some and none um, you put some uh, values inside so here's the thing you know that you could safely upcast things but with such definition like we have here you cannot also when you have something like none you cannot have one singleton of none to handle all of them because none of strings would be something different than none of, none of objects and none of integers so things are kind of you know messy a lot of boilerplate we don't want that so how could we tell the language that say okay we are no we are knowing what we're doing so when it comes to this to this type parameter in regard to this type parameter you, you can trust me that you can upcast things and things will be just okay. So such such a situation is called covariance. It's basically saying, okay, if A is a subtype of B, then F of A is a subtype of F of B. And in Scala, we denoted using the plus sign in front, in front, in front of the type. So if we add this plus sign, it's the same plus sign you saw in those kind printouts that explain how things work. Then it says that if we have option of strings, then they, it could be treated like an option of objects because objects is a separate type of strings. So right now, if we use the same code, it compiles. The other benefit is that we have option of nothing, which is object, certain, should be, there should be case object now then it all works because none is a subtype of any other type so you can upcast it to any other type so it's a perfect way to explain that you have an empty container because you can always because it's basically if you have list of nothing option of nothing you can always upcast it to whatever you want and it's perfectly safe so you have no no issues that you have several instances of option of none or several instances of empty list or nil because they are basically a container of nothing and you are safe to capcast it 
because it's immutable. If it was mutable, then you know, it's another story. Okay, next case we would like to talk about are subscribers or any so sort of objects that are fitted with values. So let's say we have a subscriber. It takes some value. Let's say we have a subscriber for value of type A, but there are also values of type B which is more specific than A. So in theory we could assume that if we have a list of values of B, then we can fit those values in the subscriber A because, well, B is an example of A, so it should work, right? But no comp compiler will say us that, well, this doesn't work this way. So how we can say it's safe to um, specify things, not generalize as in covariance, but uh, but uh, specify things. You can take this, this type parameter and make it more specific. So such situation is called contravariance. Here the um, arrows are going the other way. If we know that A is a subtype of B, then F of B is a subtype of F of A. In covariance it's the other way around, in contravariance it's, it's, it's switched, swapped. So in Scala, we can already guess that if covariance bar is denoted using um, my plus, then contravariance will be denoted using minus. So once we denote subscriber as contravariant regarding at parameter A, we are able to use subscriber A to fit all of those, fit it with all of the values of that B. Um, but the important things is that when it comes to variances, all three of them, co invariance, covariance, contravariance, they are always related to the type parameter and not the whole type. So there is a perfect example that show this, which is function. Function is covariant regarding its return value and contravariant regarding its argument. So if we have like a function from A to B and we need at some point function from B to B, then because B is more specific than A, we can pass it to, to, a, to a place that um, would will feed it with more 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 specific values. So accepting more generic arguments is okay. On the other way, if we have a function that generates b, and it's used in a place that where where a function is expected to generate values of a, which is um, more relaxed constraint when it comes to um, return value, then returning more specific result is also okay. So function is a great example of something that uses both covariance and controversy at the same time, because without it, um, language would be like pretty pretty unusable. We would have a lot of errors about function types mismatching, even though it would be completely against your intuition. So um, the way I see the variances properly is are things that are reinforced types to so that the types you are creating are used just as you are expected them to be. Well, in general, you can expect invariance for something that are mutable and you shouldn't change the type of them. Covariance when you are um, producing some values, because producing value of more um, generic type is always an option. Contravariance is very often used when you are um, accepting some values because Accepting more specific values than, than, than the context requires of you is also okay. And that's basically all there is to know about variances. So um, I'm sure you will see a lot of them, especially in, in libraries that are related to flow control and so like monics or ACA streams. Um, or even even futures in containers 
all of them basically requires let's call all of, requires usage of right variants so that things are working the way you're expecting them to work. And I think it's the last topic about parametric types, so existential types. So what are existential types? Anybody met with this term before? Okay. Basically, when we have this example like this, so we have some sequence of sequence of t, and we want to calculate the results, the size of each of those sequences and sum, sum them. So basically, we, we're not really caring about the, type, the, the t here. We just had to put it so that um, Scala would compile. We can also put there some completely unrelated types, like sequence of integers, sequ sequence of strings. Scala would infer them all to be sequence of any. So, um, yeah, this type any appears at some point, even though we actually don't need it. And it would be nice if we were able to express that we don't care about this type. So here comes the idea of existential types. The name comes from the mm, quantificators from the set theory, so from the you know, like Boolean logic. When you have universal type, we, we, we like saying for, for any possible type t, we have this function count. So when you have that type of sec of sec of t, we will return integer. So for any possible type of t, even if we don't care about this type of t. So existential types makes use of the existential quantificator, there, there is, exist. So we can use this, um, let, let's create this, this sort of notation, we say, okay, there is this sequence of type sec of t, there exists type t that will make this judgment true, but I don't really care about it. I just want to know that there is such thing. And then I can say that this function count would be a function that takes sequence or sequences of something, returns integers. I don't care what this something is. I just knew, know that I have to put something here, but I want to tell everyone explicitly I don't care what it is. So in Scala, we can express that I don't care about the type using also this um, underline. So it's very similar to how type constructor works. Uh, even though those two things are completely, completely different. Uh, and the only way for us to distinguish them is the context of usage. So when it comes to existential types, this underline Underneath com compiler uh, translate is to there's this sequence of t for some type t. It's handy to, uh, to know this thing because sometimes you want to share this type between, use it in several places, and if you don't know how to expand this syntax sugar, you will have an issue. Uh, but what I can say about this uh, syntax, it always appears when we are uh, using it to ascribe the type of some existing value. So we always see it next to the value. While when it comes to type constructor, we always see it as a type parameter. So that's how we can tell those two ap uh, apart, tells those two. How they, which, with which of them we have to do with this particular example? Um, because, as, because again, those are two different things that just have the same syntax, and it's quite unfortunate because it might be confusing to the beginners. And when it comes to existential types, then Java also has them for a long time in the form of this. Uh, question mark. 
So if you look at the Java, there are many places that use this exclamation mark to distinct that, yeah, on this place we don't care about the type of this, uh, this, this generic. Very often it will also be trans easily translated to the list of objects, but out of the box you need to do a, li a little bit of effort to um, turn it into a list of objects because Java does not uh, treat them um, the same. Okay, so that's all about parametric types so far. Structural types. So in the previous part, we already told that there is difference between class in programming language and class in mathematics. So in mathematics, class was basically a way of telling that I want to get all the values that uh, fulfill certain predicate that have certain condition. And several languages, for instance, JavaScript with the flow, let you to define something like this. So, okay, I would say that this value is of type user if it has a property named name, which would be a type of string, and property surname, which would be a type of, also a type of strings. But we're not creating a class here. Um, we're not creating a set of constructors. Um, any object you will pass here, no matter how you could create it and in what way you would create it, uh, how it would be implemented, as long as it would have the, those two uh, fields with those two types, it would be treated as, type, as user type. So it would be fun if we have something like that in Scala, so that we have declared types in other way that um, basically combine classes or using type aliases. And this is exactly what structural types are. So as you see, there is not much difference from how it looks in JavaScript. The, most, the biggest difference is that if we have some requirements about the properties of this type, we add val there. And but the same way, we can also add requirement about the methods this object should have or variables. So for instance, when we have class somebody, name string, at no point we are saying that this is type of type user. Um, but still, when we write something like this, user, and we pass somebody here, it compiles and works correctly. And the catch is that underneath, structural types rely on runtime reflection. So during compile time, we are proving that, OK, this type follows these uh, properties. It can be used this way, but because on the JVM level, it's not this class to access those properties. Scala need to use reflect, runtime reflection, so there is some runtime overhead, which is not nice. But still, if we don't need to care about performance too much, then there are ways when this is quite a friendly approach. And, and just to be sure, the um, structural type is actually this part right here. This is just a type alias which points to this structural type. If we took this thing between the brackets and put it right here, it would still compile. It would be perfectly fine. It would just like it would be anonymous structural type with, with any sort of element. It would be perfectly fine, which we'll use right in a moment. In a few minutes, but not yet. A very similar concept. Actually, an application of the structural types are refined types. When we have some existing type, for instance, thread x, and we have um, well, pure structural type, we can combine them. So we could create this x, which implements the value x, like thread x orders it to, what we, but we also add here this value y, just to make it follow the structural, structural type requirement. Um, Scala would compile it as an instance of a type of x, but it will show us, if we print it uh, using um, REPL or 
print, print line or whatever. But this type X has an additional property, this value, value Y and its type. And this is a way of Scala to like enrich existing types with those requirements from uh, structural types. And we call it refined types. Quite a lot when you use, for instance, um, Scala tests using some sort of scopes and fixtures, you are virtually using structural type that has some extra information that Scala lets you access later on. So this is something that a lot of people are using in practice, even though accidentally. Uh, as far as I can tell, this also exists in Java. Uh, in Java 9 or 10, I believe, when they introduced the var and local type inference, the compiler has that thing that if you created this extra, this additional value or method or something, you are able to access it if you uh, created this value using var and with the Java's type inference even though Java don't let you express in any way that this is a structural type. So for certain people, it's like an error of the language because you have like structural types, but without any way of name it or refer to it or pass it on anywhere else. And still, it's interesting to know that the um, Java C compiler allows such thing. And the other Type that we want that I want to talk about today is or are path dependent types. So what would be a use case for path dependent types? Let's say we have some sort of game, a card game. We have a cards, we have players, we have a game which is uh, uh, sets of players, sets of cards and a way for us to tell the game that some card, some player play the card. So the problem is that if we have two games going on at the same time, we could like switch those values, for instance, take players from one game and put it into the other game and the compiler wouldn't complain. Why would it complain? Because the types are perfectly fine but it would be results in some nasty errors that we would could be hard to debug if we didn't notice this small difference that here is game 2 and there we have game 1 so how we could tell scala that if we try to use players and cards from one game into the other game it should it should fail on the compilation level not in the runtime well if we moved Class, those classes inside the class game, so similar to Java's internal classes, then we could also refer to these classes, prepending them with this. And then when we, create, we would create the game, first game and second game, the, Java, the Scala would know that those, those types are make only sense in the context of the value they originated from. So here we would have a set of players from game one, here we would have a set of players from game two, and if we tried to use uh, players from one game to play the, the game in the other game, the compiler would fail. So techniques similar to this is quite often used in Slick or in compiler macros where um, it gives you a headache. But well, it's good to know about this mechanism because they are only improving it in dotting. Well, path dependent times will be even more powerful right than they are right now. So they, ha they are having so hopes about it. Uh, but the path dependent types are not only restricted to this, and I mean having it like that. We can uh, create something like this. We can uh, have a class X. We can say that the type Y is a type alias for string. And if we created those two different X's, and try to enforce Scala to use only value from 
originate from one of those um, uh, external values, well, a compiler wouldn't complain because it can infer the type of x to be of string. But if we make it only slightly more uh, com uh, slightly more complex, um, first of like that, that compiler cannot prove that the x's are the same, so um, the compilation would fail. Those are. This is an example of one of those tiny issues with the with how half the penny times sentences are not really intuitive, and what there is to improve when it comes to Dotty, and what would hopefully be working better. Because what we have here is what we would expect to happen all of the time. Then when we have some values, and we we have some types defi defined for a specific value, not for a specific type, which we can say because this type is declared inside uh, another trait or class, not inside an object or inside a um, package objects, which will make it like a global, something that exists on its own. And we have such internal definitions, we would always expect them to be something that is strictly bounded to the external object and something that Scala would uh, fail when you uh, detach it from the object and start to switch it with another object. So that's what we want, but when it comes to type analysis, it sometimes fails. It always works when you declare a type inside another type. With type analysis, not always. Mm. Yeah, and the, well, the other thing with path dependent types is that you can override the type aliases, which is probably the reason why here they make sure that the type Y cannot be easily inferred to be the string, just because we extend the class, while here when we have those classes um, directly, Scala is able to infer that. Okay, those two are strings. So I would say that this is probably the reason that because we have here two different instances of x, but the um, y could be overridden. We could say that, okay, in this case, we would say that this type y would be string. And so when we have some values inside working on type y, passing them on and, and etc. We would be passing on strings, here we would be passing on integers. So in a way it's, um, it's sometimes used to handle some polymorphic cases, but I'm not really recommending it because it's really messy and hard to, hard to reason. However, there are certain valid use cases for things like that. Um, and if we want to forget it for some reason, like if this player is attached to this game value, then we can use this hashtag to indicate that, okay, normally that would be path dependent type, but I want to forget for forget about it for a moment. However, the such usage, such usage really restricts us what we can do about this value. So well, it is possible at, at times, but um, the only thing that Scala can know about this class is something that would be common to all, it's something that could be inferred from the, the knowledge about game and player and sometimes it's quite a lot, sometimes it's almost nothing. However, in the next section we'll show an example when it is really, really, really helpful. So, can projectors, what are the use cases? Um, Let's say we have this, we want to have a way to, of falling back on some default value when we have an if either, which we use to um, handle errors. We, 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 in this example, we are assuming that all errors are strings. Um, and in case that we have an error, we want to recover from it using some implicit context, but because either have two parameters, has two parameters, and because um, the type class 
uh, type constraint can only be used for something that has one parameter. The workaround is that we could create a type alias and bind one of the parameters and the other take from the type alias part, uh, parameters. But it is quite bother bothering. Um, you cannot use those, you know, pretty one-liners when you have all of this in like one place. So probably we would like to figure out how you could um, get rid of this intermediate type that you can only use in this place because it's its only usage to just, you know, let you use this uh, type presentation. So the way we can approach this is at first, uh, it, we can do this in several steps. Uh, step one would be that instead of having this parameter here, we would create with fallback type to be a structural type, and then will be some type T inside the structural type that would be parametric and have this uh, binding to the first parameter. It would look like this. Right now, with fallback is a structural structural type. It has the type alias inside of it, and here we can use this uh, structural type extracting notation to get the type of T's because uh, there is not much, much difference from the from the slide before. Only that right now this type is the deprived of any type that all of the uh, type application happens here inside our structural type. But it opens up another possibility to how to um, get rid of this extra, uh, extra line, this combination of structural type and uh, path dependent types. Namely, we can move the content of this with fallback directly into, into our type. So so as we see here, we just had these brackets, passed the whole content of with fallback into these brackets. Otherwise, Scala would complain and compilation would fail. But this way, if you want to have this type either and apply one of the parameters and like hard code it and the other take from uh, the other take from here so that we would be able to use this type class notation in this example but it's quite common we might, we might also have some other usages for like binding one specific uh, type then this combination of Path dependent types and structural types let us uh, have have this like partial application on the type level, and this is ca called kind projector or type lambda. Quite a lot when you see it inside some code bases, you will see that you could have so that they used letter lambda to indicate that this is the type lambda, they would put lambda here and also lambda here. Um, however, it's quite hard to read, which is probably why at some point someone created a plugin, a compiler plugin, which do this for you, but in much more readable way. Namely, they do this with a can, can projector uh, plugin compiler, right now we, we all would only have to use this uh, exclamation mark for this type that you need to get from the outside and all the other types you could bind, bind, bind yourself. Uh, with in Doty, then, we'll be, then it will be even more easier because you will be able to create such type functions directly into the language. So that is what Doty that would bring up to us and that is what we have right now in Scala 2 with kind of projective plugin. So, oh, and the other thing that about can predictors, the only thing I need to mention is um, they have to be 
applied explicitly. And that is one issue of then if we wanted to have something like type inference. Because let's say we have a function that, well, takes one argument. We, we have function that has two parameters. One of them we expect to be type constructor. The other would be concrete type. So we could like build this f of a. Um, this way we are actually requiring that whatever we are passing here uh, can be created using is a type that uh, is created by applying a type to some type single parameter type constructor. So we can pass here a list, we can pass here an option, a set, um, but we can pass here a string because you couldn't create string this way. You can pass here integer or, or double. So in a way we are putting a restriction on what we can pass inside. But what if we wanted to do something like this? Have a function, apply first argument and then have the other argument taken from here. Except we don't want to do this using and projector because we would like to, to have it inferred. So normally if we did it in Scala, then we will have an error. Um, that is unless we use partial unification compiler option. This is something that lets you treat those multiple parameter types as something as something that is like a you know as if it was a function that takes one parameter, type parameter, and returns a function that takes one type parameter. It's used specifically in the context of type inference. So it's kind of a, like a hack in the compiler, but it's very widely used in libraries like CATS or Scala-Z are virtually useless in many cases if you don't have it in your compiler. Um, we can even try it in the REPL. Yes, as we see, if we do this like that in Scala, you know, we have a problem, it doesn't compile. Um, if we wanted to rely on type inference, so say, okay, Scala, go figure. Scala, of course, won't be able to figure it out. But if we use the partial unification flag, what will happen then? Yeah, so as long as I remember about passing the type parameter, with the partial unification, we see that it works. When we have partial unification disabled, then it doesn't compile. So as you can see, in some cases, it's very useful a trick to have, especially if you have a large code base relying on all those functional libraries. So. Yeah, definitely are things that it's worth, worth knowing. So, mm, we started from type and we reached the kind projector. That was the goal of this presentation, so maybe a small summary. Uh, in Scala, we have a quite, quite, quite a fine grained control over the types. We, ha we can say, we can use uh, type const constraints and Variance to control what, what what will be passed there, so it's an advantage over all, over other statically type languages. 
uh, Scala does quite a lot to preserve the information about types even when, you, when we don't need it, as we can see with refined types. Um, type inference always try to extract the most specific information that follows all the principles, so um, it's worth knowing because sometimes you can uh, increase the complexity of compilation if we use things recklessly. <laughs> um, if you are library authors, then probably you might consider using path dependent types. But it's good if you consider it internally because, well, they, they make quite a strain on the user. So if any of you will ever write some sort of compiler macros or have some more advanced play with Slick when we try to parameterize things and pass stuff from some from the uh, from the external environment and don't define everything in place, then you will see that path dependent types are quite uh, ubiquitous in several places. Um, well, I also forgot to mention about in the, in the previous part when when you have things like project types and product types and co-product types, they are really, really important in libraries that make use of shapeless. And if you ever de develop anything using shapeless, then without knowledge what product and co-product is, you won't get very far. So, so yeah, that's it. If you want to know more info, then I have some information already drafted on my blog in, in one of my blog posts. There is also quite a lot of information on Scala's types of ty types uh, site by Conrad Molavsky. If, you, if any of you know the guy, he's a really nice guy, really knowledgeable, one of the lead developers of Akka. And there is also the official documentation, which is uh, bothering to read, but yeah. Okay, so... Are there any questions? I have one question. Yes? Do you use it in production? Scala or? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I use type of on, on production. I use Scala on production, products and co-products in the libraries when I use shapeless a lot. I use path dependent types when I have to deal with macro based libraries. There is no way around it. If you do something more advanced with shape, with slick, then path dependent types also creep in. When it comes to ADTs, then I cannot imagine modeling domain without usage of some some types. And what else? Structural types are the rarest of them, but sometimes you use them as as an example of um, kind of projectors when you don't have this plugin installed inside your project. So. Yeah, I would say that pretty much all of the all of the all of the types I covered I use on production. Any other question? Thank you. Okay, so thanks.